Hi there, welcome everyone. We're gonna wait a couple minutes, make sure everyone here is in. See more folks joining. We're almost ready to roll. Good morning, everyone. So we're gonna wait another minute or two to make sure everyone is here and then we'll get started. Um, I have our iPad precariously balanced on a stand. So if all of a sudden things get wobbly, don't panic, I'll fix it. Um, do me a favor if you haven't already, I think everyone's already on mute, so we're good there. Just make sure your video is set to off. Um, that way is only one video stream, the one you're seeing uh, that's on my screen here. Um, welcome, it's a little uh, cloudy here at the farm this morning, but no rain, so we're doing all right. Um, we'll give another minute or so for everyone to join and then we'll get started. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about what compost is. We're going to go see the compost piles that we have here at the farm, come back and do a little demonstration and answer some questions for you. Um, I do have the, the chat feature open here, so if you have questions as we go, uh, please feel free to ask. Um, and yeah, we'll give it another give it another minute or two, and then we'll get started to make sure there's no stragglers trying to join the meeting. Um, I have my notes here so I don't get off topic. Otherwise, we'll just go off on compost tangents and we'll never learn anything. Um, just do me a favor. If someone can go to the chat real quick, I'm going to open it now. Um, and just, just give me a quick thumbs up if you can hear me all right. Or just let me know that the audio is coming through okay and everything's loud enough. That would be excellent. I'm going to find the volume knob on here and make sure that's up. Awesome. Thank you, everyone. Mm -hmm. All right, we're getting there. Excellent. All right, well, let's get started. Um, we'll add people in if they're a little late, that's okay. Um, so um, in case you are new to Zoom, um, in case you're new to Zoom, there is a chat feature off to the side. Um, like I said, we're going to make sure everyone here is muted um, and video is off, which looks like we're all doing a great job with so far. Um, and yeah, let me know if you have any questions about Zoom specifically as we go. In addition to the materials, happy to help with any technical issues you're experiencing. Um, we're coming to you outside from a hot spot too, so the internet should be good to go the whole time. But if there's any issues, feel free to um, leave a message in the chat. Um, other than that, we can get started. Um, so welcome to Composting 101. Uh, my name is Corey Thomas. Um, I'm the Education Director with Masaro Community Farm. Um, in case you're new to our uh, online workshops, we've obviously had to make some adjustments with COVID. Um, so we are, uh, Aubrey in. Um, so we are converting to these online formats uh, so that we can still bring education to folks who want to learn um, you know, how to grow their own food and do things like that. Um, and so far they've been going pretty well. It's funny, we normally do uh, beekeeping workshops, which some of you may have been a part of. Um, and in that, I'm usually decked out in full beekeeping gear. So the fact that I can just like wear a t-shirt today for this workshop is pretty nice. <laughs> um, I'm usually totally, I have all the gloves and the gear and everything for the beekeeping meetings. Um, so what else have I missed here? So in case you're, you're this is your first time participating in a farm event at all. Um, we're in Saro Community Farm. I actually have the camera set up so you can actually see the barn behind us. Um, we are a certified organic vegetable farm. We provide a CSA to the local community, which is also known as community supported agriculture. Um, so we provide produce to the surrounding community. We do community building programs. Um, we do food donations as well. Um, and a very recent project of ours, we're also managing um, community gardens in the valley with, uh, in partnership with a couple different organizations. So we're really excited to be starting that. Um, so personally, my own experience with compost, I've worked at um, multiple farms and they all did composting in some form. So I've seen kind of different strategies to doing compost on a farm. Um, it's an essential part of farming and it really an essential part of gardening as well. Um, oh, also, real quick, I do want to mention: if for whatever reason you have to duck out of this meeting, or you know, if your internet fails, anything like that, we are recording this meeting automatically. Um, so uh, this video will go out to all the participants um, after here. I just want to make sure that we are. Yeah, 
should be recording automatically. Um, yep, we are recording. Perfect. Um, so yeah, I've seen how compost is done in a lot of different ways. Um, and so we're going to get a chance to see sort of how we do it here at Masaro Farm, and then I'll be able to share some of the other ways I've seen composting being done. Um, so why do we compost? Uh, compost, the way I look at it, it's like recycling for vegetables. Um, if you have any type of garden, or even if you don't garden, if you cook in your own home, which most people do, you will have vegetable scraps and things like that. Um, and it's recycling. It's basically recycling for our food waste. Um, and there, there are specific types of food waste that you can compost, and we'll get into that more a bit later. Um, but essentially, on average, we waste about 40% of our food in the United States, which I think is crazy. Um, and anything we can do to fight that is gonna be wonderful. So composting is a way to eliminate what is going into landfills and instead return it to our own ecosystems uh, locally. Um, it's also going to be beneficial to your own garden and to your own soils on your property. So whether you have, um, you know, maybe a small garden in front of your home or you have a bunch of raised beds in your backyard, um, composting is going to be a great benefit to uh, your vegetables that you're growing or even your landscaping plants that you may have. Um, and it's going to help build up the soil on your property. Um, so it takes um, over 100 years for one inch of soil to form um, properly. And so um, we want to do whatever we can to help preserve that soil. So we do a couple things here at the farm, things like wind breaks and different methods to preserve soil on the farm, but composting is a great way to kind of help build that soil back up if you've lost it. Um, so I guess we'll start by getting a little bit into how composting works. Like I said, I have a demo, um, but we can save that for later. Um, so composting is uh, basically it's a natural process that we are kind of adapting for our own use. So what we're doing is we are having controlled decomposition. Um, so decomposition is the breakdown of organic material. Um, it happens all around us in nature. If you go out in the woods, you see leaves that are slowly disintegrating, becoming part of the soil again. You see a tree that's slowly rotting, becoming soil again. That's all decomposition. Um, so when we're composting, we're creating our own pile of decomposition. Um, Sometimes with the kids, I'll call it, it's like a gross lasagna um, that we're making with our kids um, when we compost with them out here in the learning garden. Um, but yes, it's controlled decomposition. And so it's something that happens naturally in nature. It's going to happen regardless. So if we can kind of control that and add to it and support it, um, not only does it happen quicker, um, but it can be more efficient when we are kind of um, jumping in and helping out with that. Um, so the things we're going to want in a compost pile are what um, helps decomposition happen quicker in nature. So that happens when temperatures are increased. So when it's warmer, decomposition happens faster. So your compost pile is gonna perform much better in the summer um, than it would in the winter. Um, you would need to make sure there's enough moisture um, because essentially this is entirely, almost entirely driven by bacteria. So think of what bacteria likes, likes to be hot, likes to be humid. Um, so some folks in most cases will actually water their compost. Um, depending on your setup, and we'll talk more about kind of the different setups you can have for composting a little later on. Um, they might actually water their compost pile if it's not getting enough rain. Um, and you're also going to want a large surface area. Um, so what I mean by that is you're going to want the bacteria to have as much access to your materials as possible when you're composting. So for example, I've seen some folks who when they need to add in a source of carbon, sneak peek preview for later, um, they will add cardboard, but they'll shred that cardboard first, create a lot of surface area. If you were to put a flat piece of cardboard in your compost pile, it's going to take a lot longer to break down because there's less overall surface area for the bacteria to munch on, essentially. Um, so basically what's happening in a compost pile is you have organic material. You have, you know, you have basically, um, what they call in composting greens and browns. And greens, we'll get into our demo a little bit later, but here I have some weeds that are kind of gonna be our greens. Well, they're literally green, but when we say greens, that usually means materials are gonna have high nitrogen levels. Um, so that can be weeds, that can be kitchen scraps, that could be um, grass clippings, which is a really popular one with home compost piles. Um, if you're starting to get into some of the homesteading measures, uh, chicken manure is great. Um, that's a great source of greens. It's very high in nitrogen. Um, a lot of different things that are going to contain nitrogen. Um, and then you have your browns, which are um, things to add to your compost pile that are high in carbon. Um, 
And so that could be things like wood chips, or I mentioned cardboard. Some folks use shredded cardboard. Um, it could be dead leaves, like leaves you like you rake up in the fall. Um, sort of that more aged materials are usually going to be things that are high in carbon. Um, and so what you what you're ideally looking for in a compost pile is a mixture of nitrogen and carbon. Um, and if you have too much carbon, um, the, the compost uh, won't break down at all. Um, it'll have uh, sorry, just letting someone else in here. Um, you will have um, essentially. Ah, I told you my stand was too funny. Bear with me, folks. Sorry about that. In case you joined a little late, I was saying that our stand we have is a little, a little wonky. Um, so where was I uh, with the carbon and nitrogen? If there's too much carbon, um, nothing will break down. It'll just sit there sort of in stasis. Whereas if you have too much nitrogen, um, it'll get too hot. It usually holds too much moisture. Um, it's usually gonna smell really bad. Um, so your compost shouldn't smell if you're having the right mixture of greens and browns. And we'll get into that more as we go. Um, so let's say hypothetically you have your combination of greens, you have your combination of browns um, in your compost pile and you're like, all right, let's get to composting. Um, you need bacteria and bacteria are naturally in the environment. You don't have to add any bacteria to your compost pile. They are there anyway. Um, but what's going to happen, it's really neat, is that the bacteria move in in different stages um, based on temperature. So essentially what's going to happen is you will have um, so the type of bacteria called psychrophiles, and those move in first. I might be mispronouncing that, but psychrophiles are the type of bacteria that move in when it's a little colder. So when your compost pile is basically at ambient temperature of the outside space, um, so today it's probably going to get up into the 80s when those bacteria will activate at that temperature, um, and they start breaking things down. They'll start to break things down, and your compost pile, as a result of all that movement, and that heat, it's metabolic heat. It's, there's actual physical heat that is created from the bacteria breaking things down using enzymes. Um, that heat will start to rise in your compost pile and will get warmer. Um, and then once those psychrophiles have moved, moved in and they've broken down what they can, eventually it gets too warm for them. And then a type of bacteria called mesophiles are gonna move in um, and they're gonna start um, breaking things down and munching on that organic matter and the temperature is going to rise even more. Um, and eventually it's going to get too hot for them. And then at that point you get the type of bacteria called thermophiles moving in. Um, thermophiles uh, function at very high temperatures. That is when your compost pile is um, just really cranking. It's really breaking down very quickly. Um, that's why if you ever see, um, you know, uh, folks, like if you ever see a farm where they turn a big compost pile or even smaller ones, you'll see steam coming off of them. And that's when the bacteria like thermophiles are really moving in. Um, wow, I'm thankful for my sunglasses. It's really uh, brightening up today out here. Um, so at that point, your compost is really warm. Um, and we'll get into tools a bit later, but you can test the temperature of your compost. And it, uh, ideally, you want it between 120 and 140 degrees. So it's going to be really hot. Um, that is your goal. You're going to want that really hot temperature. Um, and then eventually what's going to happen is your... Um, those thermophiles move in, they break down the organic matter, and they start to run out of fuel. So they'll start to um, become less active and the temperature of your compost pile will actually come back down. So if you were to track this, if you are a really big science nerd, which I applaud if you are, you could track the temperature of your compost pile and it would be like a bell curve. It would come up and get really hot, cool off again. Um, so it'd start to cool off again. Um, I apologize, our chickens are making a lot of noise. Um, so it starts to cool off. And at that point, the bacteria have run out of fuel, which is in this case, oxygen, right? They're munching on that organic matter, but they need oxygen to function. Um, they're what we call aerobic bacteria, which means they're bacteria that need oxygen to survive. Um, so at that point, it's your turn to jump in and help. So that's when you're gonna do what is called turning a compost pile. Um, and that means you're basically mixing up the contents of your compost pile to bring new oxygen into the mix. Um, and with most home compost piles, that's just you getting in there and mixing it, whether with a shovel or a pitchfork works great. Um, there are special tools you can use. There's some really fancy things out there that will mix compost for you. Um, you know, on a larger scale on a farm, you'll see them actually get the tractor in there and flip it with the bucket. Um, 
and there are some really, really high-tech compost piles that were actually use different pipes to inject oxygen into the pile, which is too high-tech for me, but it's really cool nonetheless. Um, so you're going to turn that compost pile and expose new oxygen um, to the bacteria that are trying to function and break down the materials organically. Um, so once you introduce more oxygen, you'll see that same bell curve again, where the bacteria will start to come back um, and activate and break down the organic material and come back down. Um, and you're going to go through a couple cycles of this heating and cooling that eventually is going to result in your raw materials you've added being broken down into compost or raw organic matter soil you can then add in and improve your soils. Um, so you're going to see a couple phases of that. So compost takes some time. Um, how much time is really dependent on factors, right? So some of the things we talked about the bacteria need. Is it warm enough? Is it, uh, is it moist enough for the bacteria to function? Um, do you have the right mixture of carbon and nitrogen? So an example I have for you of that, um, and we're going to get moving soon and see some of our compost areas here. Um, an example of that, I worked on a farm where um, they were very diligent in cleaning up their um, animal enclosures. So animal enclosures, they used a bunch of pine shavings like this um, in their animal enclosures. It was great. They kept it super clean. So by super clean, I mean if there was a couple animal droppings, they would clean up the whole barn. So as a result, there was way more carbon sources, aka the pine shavings, in their compost than there was nitrogen sources, or in this case, the animal waste. Um, so as a result of that, the compost piles were almost inert. They almost weren't breaking down at all. I was finding old compost that was really just pine shavings buried underneath more pine shavings. Um, so in that case, that ratio wasn't right. Um, so it really kind of sat down. Whereas um, other compost, if you're really diligent, you're really watching it and you had a really great mixture of those greens and those browns, um, it'll break down really quickly. Um, usually a really great turnaround period is around two months um, where you can have fresh compost to add to your gardens. Um, let's see here, what else am I forgetting to discuss? Um, and obviously things besides the bacteria are gonna help. So worms will jump in. Um, worms help add oxygen through their tunneling to the compost piles. Um, and they also break down the soil as well. Um, things like isopods or little uh, roly-poly bugs, they're gonna help add to the decomposition. They're gonna munch on things like leaves and uh, decaying matter. Um, and like I said, you're gonna want that aerobic bacteria. If your pile, compost pile starts to smell, that means something is off. Because generally, if your compost pile smells bad, that means you either have rotting material in your compost pile and or you have anaerobic bacteria. And anaerobic bacteria are bacteria that do not require oxygen. So if there are bacteria that are thriving in your pile that don't need oxygen, that tells you you aren't turning it enough. Um, so that's a good key to know, oh, I need to be turning my compost pile more frequently. Um, excellent. So what we're going to do next is I'm going to bring you a quick tour of part of the farm to show you the compost piles that we have here. Um, uh, please feel free to ask questions as we walk. Um, I'm going to take the Wi-Fi hotspot and the iPad with me. Bear with me as I take our iPad off the stand. It's a little flimsy. I'm going to turn the camera around here. Excellent. All right, cool, this is fun. I told the farm manager this morning, I'm gonna take 25 people or at least around the farm, it's gonna be fun. Um, so here we are in our learning garden, which I'm realizing we gotta catch up on some weeding here. Um, but this is one of our sort of compost deposits. I would hesitate to call this a compost pile, even though there are things that are composting in it. Um, as you can see, a bunch of weeds have sprouted up around the edges, and we're gonna talk about why that's the case here specifically. Um, so all we have here, it's, it's a wire bin that's holding the material in place. And we also have another one right over here, which I can show you. Here's some broccoli. Um, here's another one of those sort of deposits for the weeds that we pull out of the learning garden. Um, once again, there's a lot of weed seeds around here um, that have sprouted now. Um, and really the reason for that is that in this case, the compost deposit over there, the one over here, um, it's not a large enough space and the ratio of nitrogen to carbon is probably off. Um, but really the fact that it's not a large enough space is gonna mean that it can't generate the heat that it needs to start to break down, right? 
Um, this is a small pile, it's not being turned, um, and it's not gonna have a lot of heat. So as a result of that, it does not kill the seeds from the weeds that we're depositing into our compost. And that's another reason you're really gonna wanna strive for that high heat. It's gonna kill the seeds from all the weeds that you have in place. Um, oh, so a great question, Michael. So Michael asked, other than wood chips, what browns can I use? Um, most people will use either shredded cardboard if they have access to it, or the, the free thing that's probably sitting around everywhere um, would be dried leaves that you rake up in the fall. A lot of people will save their leaves for things like that, and you'll see we actually do that with a larger compost here at the farm. I'm sure we're going to head over to see. <laughs> I don't know if you can see this, but our farm cat, E.B., is curiously investigating our rabbits. E.B., what do you think? You making friends? <laughs> Rosemary doesn't know what to think about the cat. <laughs> Anyways, all right. So we're towards the back of our farm. You can see our beehives right over there. Um, and these are our larger compost piles. So um, these are the ones that Steve uh, will turn with the tractor. If you haven't been here before, Steve is our farm manager. Um, and you'll see we have three main piles here. And depending on the time of year and what materials we have, Steve will switch these up in terms of their function and their focus. So right now, this large one over here, um, you can see a lot of leaves. And we actually get these from a landscaping company um, that just, they're just raking up the leaves and we're using them here. Um, so it's a combination of leaves and pine needles. Um, some good questions here. Can white paper shredding be used in the compost? Um, I would generally avoid it because white paper, um, usually there's a couple different chemicals that are used to make it so bright like that. Um, and so I would avoid using things like that that might be a little more artificial. Um, I mean, that could go for cardboard too, depending on what kind of cardboard you're sourcing. That's why like in my own compost, like I would always advocate for using like actual organic material, something like, um, you know, dead leaves um, or, you know, if you're collecting like really small sticks that are falling around your yard, you can use that as well. You don't want things that are too thick though, um, because essentially what'll happen is, think about a rotting log. It takes forever for that to break down. Um, and something the bacteria need is a lot of surface area. So things like shredded leaves are perfect. Um, I know a lot of people, what they'll do is they'll rake up their leaves in the fall and they shred them with a mower or even like a leaf shredder, um, save them for their compost. Um, if it starts to smell bad, can it still be saved? Can we just start over? You can absolutely um, save it. So uh, in that instance, I was telling you about the, um, the farm I worked at where they had all the pine shavings that were piling up and they were basically um, just sitting um, anaerobically. And what happened is I went in there and mixed it all up and turned it in with um, more nitrogen materials. So essentially what I did in that case was I, um, I'm gonna flip the camera on so you can, so I can talk to you here. Um, so essentially what I did in that case was I started to sort of spot clean the barn and introduce more nitrogen sources or animal manure um, into the browns that were already sitting there. So, but let me be clear, when I started mixing up that really old pile, it's not horrible, um, but it was able to be saved. So no, it doesn't mean that you have to, um, you know, work with what you have and, and start right, start over. You can, you can definitely fix what's existing. Um, so we talked about the dry leaves right over here. Um, this right here is where we're adding to the pile. So this is kind of like fresh compost slash um, sort of our nitrogen sources. Um, so you can see here we have, looks like we harvested some onions yesterday. So here are some um, tops from that. I see some lettuce. Um, let's see what else we have, anything fun? Um, yeah, lots of onions and lettuce right now. But yeah, we'll add lots of things to here. Um, and you will see what's interesting is right at the top of this pile, we do have some uh, cucurbit seedlings. I'm not sure if these are probably cucumbers based off their shape, um, cucumber seedlings. So in this case, the outside of the pile didn't get hot enough to kill the, the seeds. So you have the seeds from what we dumped in here, AKA cucumbers, um, growing in there. It could have been squash as well. Um, but I have had compost piles where I know they haven't gotten hot enough because I will then take that compost, plant it in a garden, and I will get volunteer squash seedlings all over my garden. And I realized because I was adding um, spaghetti squash seed, uh, seeds to my compost all winter long. So um, if you're seeing lots of weeds sprouting your compost, that tells you that you're just not getting the pile hot enough. Um, so that means you need to be mixing more um, or having a larger volume to be working with um, in that case. So this is kind of like sort of our greens 
piles, kind of like new additions. Um, and then over here is where Steve will mix those two. So we're kind of taking our carbon and our nitrogen, and mixing it together to make our finished compost. Like I said, Steve will adjust this based on, um, you know, the time of year, what he has to add, things like that. But for now, that's kind of the outline here. So this is where we'll go um, for compost for the learning garden. And you can see it's a nice mix. Um, uh, we do see some shredded leaves. We do see some fresh looking soil. Um, and he'll come in here and turn this occasionally to introduce new oxygen to the pile um, and get it mixed up. So this is kind of a larger scale compost. And we will talk about sort of home setups, sort of like the different options as a homeowner or someone as a backyard gardener, what you can do. Um, and that's what we do here at the farm. Are there any questions as we head back over? Um, oh, is an ideal ratio of greens to brown? What, yeah, proportions, that's a great question. Um, so as a general guideline, um, what you're gonna want is you're gonna want a two to one ratio of browns to greens. So picture for every two shovel scoops of, you know, dried leaves for, you know, fallen leaves, for example, you're going to want one shovel full of, um, you know, fresh weeds that you've pulled out of your garden. So ideally you want a two to one ratio and you'll find that that, you know, that might change based on the ingredients you're adding. So for example, if you have like really thick, I don't know, something like mulch that you're adding where that's really thick wood, um, that's going to bind um, the nutrients um, more and it's gonna take longer to break down. Whereas if you have really fine shredded, um, you know, fallen leaves, then you you'll, might find that it breaks down a little faster. Um, so let's see here, let me flip my camera around. Bear with me for a second, folks. I'm gonna put the camera back on its stand here. Without dropping the iPad, it would be a great uh, Okie doke. We did it. Yay. All right. So I do want to show you sort of a demo um, of what a compost pile would look like. Now, I have here, just making sure you can see it okay. Um, this is just an empty soda bottle, just to show you, because it's clear, so you can kind of see what's happening on the inside. Um, and so, obviously, this would be way too small for a compost pile, um, right? You're going to want to, like I said, create a lot of, um, uh, a lot of volume, so you can generate a lot of heat. But this is good for demonstration purposes. So. We're starting our compost pile. We have some browns. So like I said, this could be wood chips. This could be freshly, uh, you know, old leaves that fall in the fall. Pine needles. Um, if you have any sort of uh, mulch or, or straw you, you used for maybe, you know, getting some grass started in your lawn. Um, lots of things to be considered um, browns. Um, so you have browns and you have greens. So this is going to be weeds you've pulled out of your garden, grass clippings. Um, you know, basically anything that's like freshly growing. So, um, you know, if you cut down, you know, a lot of weeds or new plants, you can, you can use that as well. Um, great question. Should big, big chunks of the vegetation be cut up before putting them in like broccoli? Uh, yeah, you certainly could. Cause like I said, you want to create a lot of surface area, right? So if you can cut things up more, that's great. Like that's just going to um, help your compost generate faster. It's going to give the bacteria more access to what they're trying to break down. Um, so you have our, our browns, you have our greens, and then obviously more greens uh, are kitchen scraps. So I'm going to include that in the greens pile. Kitchen scraps, in most cases, are going to be great nitrogen sources, um, but not all kitchen scraps are created equal. Um, for example, essentially, you're really only going to want to add fruit and vegetable materials. You can add things like bread um, materials. You want to avoid meat products, essentially. Um, because in most home composting setups, you won't have the um, volume to create the heat needed to break down harmful bacteria and break down the meat product itself. It's probably gonna sit there and rot if you were to add it to a home compost setup, um, unless you have like a big pile, like a one we, you know, something we had here. Um, so avoid adding meat products, fish, um, you know, bones, things like that to your compost pile. Um, eggshells, you can add. A lot of folks add eggshells, and that's great because that's a source of calcium, which plants do need. Um, 
So uh, be mindful of what kitchen scraps you add because you can't add everything you'd like to. Um, so we have our compost pile, you have your space set up and we're still gonna get into um, the different setups you can have. So we said there's kind of a roughly a two to one ratio, right? So I'm gonna take two handfuls of browns then we add one handful of greens. These weeds are clumping together. This might be a large green scoop, um, just like that. And I'm gonna pack it down just to show you the different layers. Um, and then, you know, same thing. We're add two scoops of brown to one scoop of green. See, in this case, I should have cut these weeds up more because right now they're just jamming up the whole system. And then adding some of our kitchen scraps in this case. Um, and like I said, it sounds weird, but essentially what you're making is a really gross lasagna. Um, you're layering these things on top of each other so that the bacteria can move between the layers and get at the different things that they need. Oh, I forgot a second scoop of browns. I have a very small compost going and I'm wondering, for example, last night we had a lot of rain, so it gets very wet. Um, yep. Did I then add just dry leaves or should I be turning it? Uh, I, always, I always wonder about that. I, always, I do shred my leaves, so I do usually add that to it, but underneath it's still pretty wet. Hmm, well, uh, what does your setup look like? Like what, where can the water drain to? Is it just sitting on the bare ground or do you have it in something? It, uh, it is on the bare ground, but I'll say, I'm gonna say it's only like uh, a, two feet by two feet kind of square thing. It's not large because I live alone, so I don't have a large one. I do, yeah. have, I do have a couple of them going at the same time, but I'm always concerned once we have a really heavy rain that it's so saturated. Yeah, well, I'd say just give it time to, to, to dry out. Um, I mean, as long as you have the ratio right, it's okay if it's really wet. Um, you know, that just means you're not gonna wanna water your compost pile. You're gonna let the rain kind of let it dry out, um, especially as we move into some of the warmer months. Um, you know, it's going to be less of an issue because it's going to get so hot during the day. Um, but yeah, I, I would say in general, it's okay if it gets really wet from a rain. Um, you know, the worms will, will move out of the pile just so they don't drown. Um, and they'll move back in once it dries out. You certainly can mix it. Like, it doesn't hurt to over mix your compost pile. Um, so if it's looking like you need to kind of mix things up to get some of the water moving, you can certainly continue to mix it. Okay, um, so I can kind of spread it open a little bit. Sure. Not, yeah, because that's I do the two things. I try to spread it open a little bit to dry it out, and then I try to add some some more greens to it. Yeah, for sure. You can spread it out and let it dry, and then make sure you repile it so you can try and get that heat generated. Right. Um, but yeah, it doesn't hurt to overmix. Okay. Um, thank you. Yeah, of course. Um, so we have our layers of browns and greens here. I've added some kitchen scraps, and you know what we'll do is we'll we we'll let this sit for a while um, and let things start to break down and then we'd be able to turn it and start to mix up the ingredients more so the bacteria have more access to it. Um, so that's your little demonstration compost pile there and put that off to the side. Um, so I did wanna talk about, um, oh, and in terms of the moisture level, you actually made me think of something really important. So a great way to tell if your compost pile is too hot or too dry is do something called the sponge test. I'm gonna adjust this here so you can kinda see me here. Yes, the iPad is staying, we're doing well. Um, is sort of what I like to call the sponge test. So uh, if you have your compost and if you were to pick up a scoop of that compost, wear garden gloves if that's a little gross for you, um, and, and squeeze it, you should get, so when you initially pick up the pile, it should not be dripping. And when you squeeze it, a couple drops of water should come out. Um, if no water comes out, you know your compost pile is too dry, uh, you can water it. Um, and if you're, if it's dripping when you lift it up or if you squeeze it and just a ton of water comes out, that tells you it's too wet. Um, water, moisture is great for a compost pile, but without the proper levels of air getting into it, um, you're gonna start to get that anaerobic bacteria starting up. Um, and the bacteria, the aerobic bacteria, the good bacteria aren't gonna be able to do their job. So moisture is great, but you gotta make sure you have air in there as well. Um, so let's get into some of the different setups people have. Like we've talked about the theory and how it works, but like logistically, what are you gonna do in your yard? Um, so um, something that's really popular, some folks like to use is what I call like a barrel composter. 
Um, and you see these at hardware stores. Um, and basically how they work is it's a, a stand and then a large uh, barrel that opens up on one side. You can fill it with your greens and your browns and your kitchen scraps, close it back up. And there's usually some kind of crank or some kind of mechanism to turn that actual barrel. Um, there are a couple different pros and cons to that. And I'll admit, um, prior to doing a little more research for this, I was like, I do not like barrel composters. I don't think they work, but I learned some good things about them. So um, there are some pros to the barrel composter. So um, pros are they're very user friendly, right? You can load up a small uh, batch of greens and browns and you have a hand crank. You're not standing there with a pitchfork, turning everything. Um, super convenient, right? Um, it also looks very neat and orderly, like it kind of blends in, you know, you can put it along the side of your house or back by your garden. Um, it's very organized looking, it's very uh, compact and contained. Um, and also it is pest resistant. So if you're dumping a bunch of, you know, for example, old broccoli or apple cores or banana peels to a compost pile, that's going to attract pests. So if you have this contained barrel, the pests aren't going to get at it. Um, so it's kind of pest proof, which is pretty handy. That's uh, one pro I had not thought of previously. Um, some cons to those barrel composters is that your um, larger organisms that help break down the compost uh, can't get in and out of that barrel. Meaning, you know, like I said, worms are amazing for compost. Um, and things like isopods, little roly poly bugs, different um, insects moving in can't get in and out of that. So if you scoop in some worms with your compost, great, and it's in a barrel composter, but otherwise they really can't get in and out of that. Um, so you're losing uh, part of the team, so to speak, that's gonna help your compost break down. Um, and also they can't get out if needed. So if you have a hundred degree day and you have that metal barrel or black plastic barrel sitting there, um, the worms can't get out and they'll just die from the heat. Um, so that's another thing to consider with the barrel composter. Um, they don't work well in winter um, because they're pretty small. They don't have a lot of um, a lot of mass to them. So, for example, that person that had the question about the small sort of two by two, um, you know, that can work great in the summer because it's small enough so it can still get a lot of heat. But in the winter time, that will slow down considerably because it can't get the heat going. Um, so the barrel compost won't work as well in the um, colder temperatures. Um, what else? Oh, and like I mentioned, it's tough to get the temperature high enough because it's relatively small. Um, so, so those are the pros and cons to a barrel composter. I've used them before. Um, you know, they're really handy to just crank them instead of using a pitchfork. Um, but you know, there are other pros and cons there that you should consider if you're getting a barrel composter. Um, so my preferred method of composting, um, which is um, so I'm biased, in case you can clearly tell here, um, is using pallets. Um, so pallet bins are an awesome way to compost. Um, and essentially what you'll do is, I mean, depending on where you get them, pallets can be free. If you ask around for businesses that aren't using them, or if there's maybe some a little older, a little more beat up and they don't need them. Um, and essentially what I've done in a couple different instances, if I, I may, will make um, just uh, squares out of pallets. I'll make like a cube out of pallets. I'll make four walls out of pallets. And honestly, I just tie them with rope. You can get fancy and drill them together and things like that. I just tie them up with rope. So at this point, I've spent $5 at Lowe's on some rope and I've gotten free pallets from somewhere um, that was getting rid of them anyway. And I have free compost bins. Um, so what I'll do is I'll make sort of a square of compost bins um, and I'll make one, you know, box and I'll start to load up my browns and my greens in them. Um, and at that point, I can let that decompose. What's handy about the pallets is I can then make a second bin right next to that first one. Um, what's great about that is that, consider if you have a barrel composter, it mixes in place, right? But think about if you get a box or a, an actual just pile in your yard, which works too, that's also free. Just dumping them in a pile in your yard is a free compost pile, kind of what we have here. There's no money going into the setup, right? Um, but let's say you have a box for your compost. You have to turn it, right? Well, you're gonna have to get to the stuff at the bottom of that compost pile. So that means you're gonna have to shovel everything out of your compost you know, bin or whatever, mix it up and then dump it back in. Um, and that's kind of a pain. Um, so what's nice about the pallet bins is I can make one where I start to throw everything in and then make a second one right next to it that's empty. And then I just 
throw the compost right into that next bin. So that way I'm both turning it and opening up a new bin um, where I can add new materials. And so um, at that farm I mentioned had a lot of backup of compost. Um, that's what I did. I set up pallet bins and I moved everything down. So I filled up a bin, waited a couple of weeks for that initial temperature, you know, uh, rise and fall, and then turned it into an empty bin and filled up that bin all over again. So at that point, you're kind of creating a sequence of compost. Um, you don't need a ton. You can do two. You can do three. Um, so some pros to that, it's cheap or free. Um, pallets have the slats on the side, so they're very well aerated. Um, you're already letting oxygen in. It's not like a solid plywood side um, or, you know, a metal or plastic side. Um, they're very easy to rotate. Like I said, you can kind of just put one bin into the next um, with the pallet bins. Um, what else? Um, oh, and what's really handy is you can have what I call starter bins um, for your compost. So I could have, let's say I have a couple pallet bins in a row. I could have one bin where I only add greens to it. And I can have one bin where I only add browns to it. And then if I have a, you know, the rest of my bins, I can literally count how many scoops I'm adding of each uh, ingredient to my compost. So rather than approaching your compost pile and like, ah, did I add enough browns here? Did I add enough greens? You can have the ingredients right there and portion it out as you add them to your new compost bin. So that's something that can work really well. Um, that can take up as little or as much space as you'd like it to, depending on uh, sort of what your volume is that you're working with. For most folks, you're just kind of a small backyard garden. Um, you know, two pallet bins is great. You can add ingredients and move them back and forth between the two um, to mix them. Um, so those are the pros to pallet bins. And in case you can't hear in my voice, that's why I like pallet bins a lot. Um, but there are definitely some cons. Um, it's not very pretty looking, um, especially if you get some old beat up free pallets. It's not going to look that neat. Um, so if you are conscious about that and making sure your garden space looks very neat, um, they won't look very pretty. Um, and also they're not pest proof, right? So uh, if you have a lot of issues with, with um, mice or rats or raccoons um, in your neighborhood, um, that could attract pests. Um, but having said that, if you are doing things, for example, burying your kitchen scraps in your compost, so rather than just dumping it right on top, kind of making a bit of a hole in your compost and dumping them in and covering them, that's going to help sort of fight that pest issue. So there are more than, you know, one ways to approach that. So every um, time that I add wet ingredients, I'm always, I'm recycling everything, uh, the, I'm composting all the wet, all the fruits and vegetables. Every time I do that, should I be adding dry on top of it or should I be just letting the sun right now decompost it? Um, so I think ideally you're just going to um, want to make sure you're, like you can let the sun dry it out. Um, and you don't have to necessarily, it's not necessarily dry versus wet ingredients. Um, it's more just the browns versus greens. So if your pile gets completely rained on, it's totally soaked, you could let it sit. But if you want to be really active and engaging with it, and like really on top of it, I would mix it. That way you're kind of introducing more oxygen to the pile to combat how much water there is in the pile. Um, okay. And you, if you want, you can certainly add some, um, some additional ingredients to kind of dry it out a bit as well. Um, okay, you know, so I didn't, I didn't phrase, then I didn't phrase that correctly. My question, oh, my question is, if I went go out right this morning and I add a lot of wet ingredients from breakfast, we'll say banana peels, eggshells, yep. and that stuff, should I automatically be adding brown to the top of it? Yes. So if you're adding greens, you should be adding in browns as okay. well. You want to make sure you keep that ratio. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, of course. Um, and then a third option, you know, if you don't, if you like the idea of larger bins like compost. Um, or, but you also like how um, the barrel bins look very neat and organized, you can construct bins. Um, so uh, one style I've seen is folks will use larger four by four um, posts and they will actually slide in boards into the posts um, so that you can lift up and move piles around. Um, I might have some pictures of that. I might be able to share with this group after our workshop is over. I didn't think to get pictures ahead of time. Um, this might be hard to visualize, but um, using posts with movable boards can be really helpful because then it's easy to get to the materials to mix it. Um, can be really great. Um, I also want to add, let's say maybe you are a little hesitant to be composting yourself, but you still obviously want to be supportive of fighting food waste in our communities and you, know, you want to help sort of do this activity that fights climate change, but you maybe don't want to get your hands dirty. That is okay. Um, there are some great services that you can use that will actually take your food waste for you, including meat products in most cases. Um, two of the ones in the area that I'm aware of, um, there's a big one around New Haven. Um, that's, I think it's called Peels on Wheels. 
Um, I have to double check me on that. But that's one that's in the New Haven area. Um, in the Fairfield area, I know there's one, um, it's called Curbside Compost. Um, and they have various pricing based on, you know, what sort of food waste volume you have or what you're looking for specifically. Um, I'm sure there are other organizations wherever you are, if you are in those areas um, that have services like that, you just gotta do some research and figure out who's taking care of that. Um, but those are two in the area that I'm aware of um, that do that. So in case you really wanna support composting and fight food waste, but um, maybe you don't have the space, maybe you're in an apartment. Um, speaking for someone who's in an apartment right now trying to compost, um, it's not easy or does not smell nice. Um, so that's a way to sort of still get involved in that. Um, let's say you're really into this and you, know, you, you sort of listen to what we've talked here and you're like, I need to know more about this. Um, UConn, some of you might know they have a master gardeners program. They also have a, ma a master composter class that you can take. So you can become a master composter um, and know, go way more in depth than what we've covered here today. Um, so um, as we go, um, please feel free to add any, ask any questions in the chat feature there. Um, we're gonna try and stick to the chat feature um, just because uh, otherwise we'll get a lot of people speaking at once. Um, I think I covered everything I wanted to in our, in our, in our uh, mission today, but I wanna answer questions and I like that they're rolling in. Um, can you put some vegetable scraps directly in your garden? Does that help the soil? Um, sure, I mean, you could. I mean, uh, that's essentially your composting in place, right? Um, and you can do that. Um, certainly it's not going to harm anything. Um, if you were to use larger quantities of greens, like for example, grass clippings, if you're dump grass clippings directly into your soil, um, that actually can, uh, it's called burning. Um, it's too much nitrogen and it'll actually, um, burn your plants. Um, so you'll notice a lot of, um, uh, yellowing of your plants, um, and they'll start to die off if you add too many greens at once. Um, so maybe like, you know, an apple peel or something like that, that's fine in your garden. Um, you know, it's going to take a while to break down because it's not mixing with other things, but it will still break down because it's in the soil where those bacteria already are. Um, that's why most people will separate it and do an actual compost bin opposed to directly in the bin just because you want to avoid burning your soil. Um, same thing goes for, while well, I'm thinking of it, if you have like backyard chickens or hey, if you even have like goats or something like that, um, you really want to make sure that your compost pile is finished before you add it to your garden. So you wanna make sure that everything is broken down and you've gone through a couple cycles of that heating and that cooling um, before you add it into your compost, or before you add it to your gardens. Otherwise what can happen is you can create those burns um, and it will kill your plants. So you really wanna make sure your, your compost is uh, finished cooking um, before you add it to your garden beds. Um, how do we keep rodents out? Great question, Michael. Um, so like I said, you can use something like a barrel composter. Um, and that keeps the, the pests out fine. I've seen folks who make like outdoor bins out of like lumber or things like that. Um, I've seen them use hardware cloth around the edges. Um, I don't have anything with hardware cloth around here, but if you go to Lowe's or Home Depot, it's a wire uh, metal mesh um, and you use like quarter inch usually and that will keep pests away from that. Um, it doesn't stop them from climbing into it um, unless, you know, some people do put a actual um, wooden framed hardware cloth top on it. And then, hey, you have like the Fort Knox of compost piles, which is great. Um, so hardware cloth is really the answer if you have outdoor piles. Um, and then if you wanna get like really in depth on it, I know there's certain herbs and things like that will deter mice. Like I think mint um, actually deters mice. Although if you plant mint near your compost, prefer it to be everywhere because mint spreads like crazy. Um, so I would say like the simple answer is hardware cloth, um, but there's certainly other things you can do um, to help prevent that. So, um, let's see here. More, I love all these questions. Um, are coffee grounds considered greens? Yes, they are. Um, coffee grounds are great for compost. So definitely compost those. Um, are orange peels and pineapple rinds okay? Um, yes, those are okay. Uh, something you will notice about compost is there are certain substances that don't break down as quickly. Um, and there are some things that the worms and the isopods will avoid. Um, one thing I know of is um, orange peels generally, like the worms will avoid that, but they'll still break down over time. Um, avocado peels, for whatever reason, get avoided um, by the worms. Um, so there are certain things that will still break down. You'll just notice them in your pile uh, longer, like they'll take a while. Um, Hi, Ann. Ann has a question. I built a barrel on a pile during the winter. I put my kitchen scraps 
in the barrel since it usually just freezes outside and the ground is frozen so I can't dig it into my pile. In the spring, I start spinning the barrel again. Am I wrong in thinking that it really isn't decomposing during the winter? Um, it will, it's just a little slower, that's all. Like, so it will still break down. Um, and it sounds like a great way to kind of store it over the winter, right? That way you, like, you can still mix it. So it will still break down, it just isn't as, as fast. Um, and ideally, like the, the mission with compost is you want a quick turnaround. You want um, compost for your soil, for your gardens quickly. So you kind of want to be really active and engaging with it. Um, so a barrel composter is fine. Um, just in the winter time, especially, it's going to be a little slower. So that's all. Um, longer wait for the reward of nice compost. Um, can my daughter's durable bedding, all natural pine shavings, be added to the compost after it's used? Yes. Awesome. And that's like a super creative uh, way to avoid things going to landfill, right? So in that case, pine shavings are great. Um, and durable waste is fine. Um, you want to avoid, so I, I didn't discuss this before, but things like chickens, um, livestock, you have like goats, um, sheep, uh, those of you that have like horses, um, small animals like gerbils, that's fine. You want to avoid adding in um, waste that's from a uh, carnivore, like a dog or a cat. Um, you want to avoid adding that in just because it's going to take a while to break down. It's going to make the pile smell pretty bad. Um, and just because it's sort of like a different compound, um, you know, think about an herbivore. It's really just... Um, the waste is just, um, it's plant matter. So it's gonna break down a lot faster. So um, avoid adding in waste from animals that are eating meat or carnivores like dogs and cats. Um, what kind of setup would you recommend for someone with a very large vegetable garden? Awesome, Wes, I approve of your large vegetable garden. We recently moved and are using roller bins. We're not producing enough compost for our needs with a larger garden now. Um, large garden, vegetable garden, um, it depends on like your aesthetics. Like if you want something that's like super functional and quick and easy, I recommend the pallet bins. Um, just cause they're really easy to put together. It takes like literally 10 minutes to strap together some pallets. Um, and someone asked about the pests. If you want, you can be a little more in depth and surround them in hardware cloth and even add like a, a hinge top to it with hardware cloth. Um, but otherwise, uh, pallet bins are great. If you want something that looks really nice, there are some awesome, awesome designs online. Um, where you can put together things with like posts and really nice, you know, things like two by tens that look really, look really great. Um, and that way it looks a little more organized, but it's still really functional for you. So I recommend if you have a large vegetable garden, larger bins, I'd say at least like a four by four, um, sort of set up, um, you know, four feet by four feet or even larger. Um, and it depends on sort of like your activity level too, like a larger bin, think about it, it's gonna take a while to turn it. You don't have to do it every day or even every week, you know, give it a couple weeks in between turnings, but um, it is a workout. Um, so I recommend, um, if your compost is in the beginning stages, I recommend using a pitchfork, because that way you can kind of get at some of the more like, like, you know, this is a pain to shovel, um, but a pitchfork can kind of get in there and, and stick to it. Um, things like weeds as well. Um, but then you'll see once your compost starts to break down more, a shovel is going to be better because at that point it's more closer, it's closer to soil. Um, so that is what I would recommend. Uh, should we monitor the temperature of the compost pile? Can it get too hot? Um, no, but it's, you asked an awesome question. So I forgot to mention a compost thermometer. So if you are really into this and you're like, I want to get this down to a science, you should get a compost thermometer. Um, they're on Amazon. You're probably going to find them in local hardware stores too or garden supply stores. Um, it's a thermometer. It literally looks like a gigantic meat thermometer. So picture like a metal, you know, the metal spike, a little uh, dial at the end. They have that for compost, except it's like this big, at least like they they're, they're huge. Um, and they will actually have these really handy um, ranges on the gauge. It will tell you like too cold, too hot, you know, sorry, not too hot, just right. Um, if your compost pile gets too hot, it can, but think about it. It's getting hot from the metabolic activity of the bacteria, right? So once it gets past a certain temperature, the bacteria start to die off. So it's kind of self-regulating. Once it gets too hot, it'll start to cool back down because the bacteria stop moving. It's too hot for them to function. Um, so oh, you really, it will get too hot, but it'll slowly back down and you always want to fight to make it hotter so that things break down faster. Um, should the pile be in full sun is it okay, but just work slower in the shade should it be away from the house. Um, away from the house is generally nice. Um, just like, like I said about the pest issues. Um, it, it's generally a better idea to have it away from the house. You know, even if you have really great pest measures, you might still have things coming to like sniff and investigate. Um, it's kind of like similar thing, like do you want to put your trash cans right next to your house? Like you, that, you might not have that option, but if you can, like, you know, sort of over by the garage or you know, the driveway kind of thing would be nice. Um, so compost is the same way. If you want to try to avoid having them really close to the house, that'd be better in general. Um, 
and uh, sorry, I missed part of the question. Um, is it okay? Uh, oh, right, in the sun. Um, so having it in the sun is gonna help keep it warm. Um, I've seen some people that actually will cover their compost so they can really control the amount of water. That's actually, if any of you ever um, been to or seen um, Common Ground uh, High School in New Haven, they have an awesome, awesome compost set up and there is covered and they actually water it so they can regulate it like to a T. Um, so having it in the sun is great. In the shade, it's not gonna make a huge deal. It's more like the ambient temperature, right? Like how warm it is on a certain day. Like, yes, in the shade, you might see a five degree difference, um, but it's not gonna be anything too extreme. So I wouldn't worry too much about the shade versus the sun. Um, so Wes says, I've been using three bin pallets in it before. What would be the day-to-day -day uses of something like that? When to add brown grease? Oh, so like the maintenance of it, like a schedule. Um, so, I mean, you can add to it daily, right? Depending on what you're doing. So if you have, <laughs> For example, I use some catching up in the learning garden here, lots of weeds, right? Um, you might be adding uh, weeds to it every day, right? So in that case, it's really nice to um, have some browns like nearby, like some shredded leaves to add in. That way you can kind of manage it. As you're adding the greens, you already have some browns that are there ready to like balance it out. Um, so you can add to it whenever. Um, with a three pallet bin, usually I just wait for it to be full and then I'll turn it. Um, but if I'm not adding a lot and it's taking a while for it to fill, I might turn it every three weeks or so. Um, depends how busy you get with other parts of the garden, right? Sometimes the compost kind of can take the back seat. Um, but ideally, if you want to mix it like every other week, every three weeks, um, that's great. Um, any longer than that, and like you should probably be mixing it more just to make sure it's getting oxygen. And a great way to check that, right? Rather than wondering like, oh, is my compost finished in the middle? Is it still more time? Is investing in a, a compost thermometer because then you can measure the temperature and be like, oh, my compost is starting to cool off. I should probably start turning it in the next couple of days. Um, so should we put fireplace ash in the pile? That is a good question. I do not know a concrete answer, but I will find one. I've heard of some people doing that. And I remember, it's right, like I remember hearing about whether it's good or bad to do it. I don't want to give you a solid answer now. I will follow up in the follow-up email with this recording. I'll answer that question. So awesome question. Let me get back to you on that. Um, if anyone else knows the answer, feel free to like add that in the chat. Um, do you buy worms to add or just wait for them to populate in the compost pile? Um, it depends on what your preference are. Um, you know, if you are living in like, um, I don't know, like a pretty like suburban or like rural area, like the worms will find the bin just fine. Like they will move in on their own. If you want to buy worms and sort of jumpstart it, you're certainly welcome to. Um, and you can also see, you know, like you could start a compost pile and let's say the first time you go to turn it, like, wow, I have not spotted a single worm. Um, maybe you buy some, invest some, and add them in. Um, some great companies that do that. Um, there is Uncle Jim's Worm Farm is a great one. I'm not sure if they're local, but I know that's one that we worked with before. Um, there's also Wiggle Room, um, which is a Connecticut organization. That's actually where we purchased our worm bin from. Um, and uh, we have uh, worked with them before. They, I think they supply worms as well. It might just be the hardware though. Um, so yes, you could certainly add worms or just wait, you know, you could see if they jump in on their own. Um, but if it's not happening, you certainly could add some. Um, but that is a sign of a healthy compost, right? If you have worms that are moving in and out, you see the um, insects and small creepy crawlies moving around in there. Um, that means you're, you're doing a great job and it's, you're creating very healthy soil. Um, excellent. Uh, any, other, any other questions here? Oh, so watering the compost, when would we do that? Um, so once again, I mentioned that sponge test, right? So if you can kind of like, you know, what I normally do is get like a rake or something, pull away the top bit of your compost and get something sort of, not the middle, but you know, a couple inches down, pick up a pile of that and, and is it, if it's sopping wet, it's too wet, you don't need to water. If you squeeze it and not a single drop of water comes out, it feels dry, that means you should water. Um, that's certainly helpful to do. Um, you know, uh, as that person was mentioning, who was, was asking the question before, I feel like this time of year, it's raining pretty frequently, so you probably won't have to as much. But once we get into August, it's probably gonna be helpful for you to water your compost, um, for sure. Okay, so I have a question and I do apologize. This is my first time on Zoom and you mentioned using the chat versus what I'm doing on the microphone. So how do I switch over to doing the chat thing that you referred to? I do apologize, but I don't know oh, how to That's okay. Use it. Welcome, to, welcome to your first time Zoom. This is exciting. So if you're on the Zoom feature, if you go in the upper right-hand corner of your computer screen, there should be a little three dots that says more. And if you click on that, there should be a little button that says chat. 
are you seeing it? If you're not, you're welcome to add the question, ask the question now. No, unfortunately, I don't. But that's next, all right. What's the question? Next time I'll try to search for it. But I do apologize because that's the only thing I could see was the mute button, not the chat button. Oh, Thank that's you. all right. Thank you. Oh, also, oh, also the chat, the button. Across. Oh, it's on the bottom too, on your end. Yeah, I'm on the iPad. It might look a little different. Um, excellent. All right. Well, I think the questions are slowing down, but obviously, if you have any others, um, feel free to feel free to ask. Send us an email. Like I said, I'm no expert. Um, I do know a couple of master composters, and if you're like really into this, I recommend you look into that class because it's uh, definitely uh, worth your time. Um, so with that, I think we'll finish up today. Um, I want to mention we do have a couple other workshops. Um, can we come see? When can we come see the bins in person? Oh, Wes, that's a great question. So I actually don't have those style bins here at Masaro. Um, it's funny. I so I actually have a part-time job um, working with some community gardens up in New Britain, and we have them there. Um, I've set up a couple there. Um, I uh, I'm not sure if they still have them, but I used to work at a place in Westport, Wakeland Town Farm. They had them there. Um, so uh, there are a couple places to see them. If I can find some pictures um i might i'll dig around some of my old photos see if i can at least find some pictures to send you um you have a recommended method to put citrus and avocado from putting it in a compost pile um uh, michael you can certainly still put them in the compost pile it'll just take a little more a little while longer to break down so i still think you should add them in like it's still food waste that can break down um it might just take a little while longer you know the worms will avoid it because it's a little more acidic um but i still add them in um for sure. So, um, excellent. Well, thank you so much for everyone for joining us today. Like I said, we have a couple other workshops coming up. Um, we're going to have a beekeeping workshop next weekend, um, which is really exciting. We're really thankful to have that series of the Connecticut Beekeepers Association. Um, in the beginning of July, we're going to have three foragers out here. There's these folks that do amazing, like wild foraging, and they're going to take you through the nature trail virtually um, and go searching for different things. So we're really excited about that one. Um, so if you haven't signed up for our newsletter, please check out our website and do that. Um, it goes out about once a week and you can have an idea of what we do. Um, please follow us on Instagram and Facebook. So you can see the different things that we have, um, there as well. Um, besides that, I hope you all have a great day. Uh, good luck with your composting. Uh, great job fighting climate change. Um, and thank you. I'll be sending a follow-up email. It'll have our, uh, this recording so you can follow up, um, as well as I'll try and hunt down some pictures of different compost bins for you. Um, oh, John, you were certified master composter. Excellent. So someone joining us now is a certified master composter. Yes, John, I'd be happy to get some of the info if you want to send it my way. Um, excellent. Oh, Wes, good question about the chickens. We had a chicken workshop here. Um, when was it? Uh, a couple of weeks ago, um, but it was free. I can send you the video for it so you can watch. So. Um, Send me an email, Wes, in case I can't track down your email independently through the Zoom. Um, it's education at masarofarm.org. Send me a note looking for the chickens workshop. I'll, I'll happily send it to you. Um, chickens is something I am a little more knowledgeable than the compost. So <laughs> awesome. All right. Thank you, everyone. I hope you all have a great day. Enjoy this nice weather. Um, and yeah, have a good weekend. Bye, everyone.